All right, so today I'm going to showcase a sim project that I have been working on and kind of how you can go about it as well yourself. Um, if you're not familiar with what a sim is or a system information and event management system, that would be something like Splunk. Splunk is used for monitoring and searching through big data and it indexes and correlates all that data for you. I have this diagram here that shows how I've been going about um, the creation and logging into everything that I have. So we start off here with our local machine, which would be my main computers. It could be my phone, my desktop, my laptop, doesn't really matter. And then we have a jump box, which is a server that I SSH into or access remotely via command line. And through that jump box server, which has a private IP, I go ahead and SSH into my web server, which is hosting a WordPress site. And then I can also SSH into my Splunk server, which has another private IP. With the web server and its public traffic, I generate a lot of information in the access logs in for Apache, which is what is running the web hosting or the web server for me. I have to have a forwarder, so a log forwarder set up right here that sends all the logs from here to my Splunk machine. That way I can monitor it and go through and index everything in real time. And the last thing here is on the side we have the internet or the public web traffic. So this would be everyone but me. So not using my local machine, all of the information or traffic that has been going to the website, but there's also been traffic generated to my web server. I've noticed a lot of uh, IP addresses already trying to break into it um, through SSH mostly, but um, a little bit with the website as well. All right, so I'll go ahead and show my Splunk dashboard that I have set up now. Um, using specific searches, I was able to make these visualizations to put onto the dashboard and it's showing all of this information in real time. So this is how many times my machine has been pinged. Uh, this is again for the web server and it shows within the past four hours. Looks like this IP address here uh, pinged it 222 times. We have this one that is even greater amount 444. Uh, the reason why this is good to keep note of or to watch over is because this could be a possible DDoS attack or denial of service. If you get enough machines pinging yours all at once, you're going to end up bringing that server down or slowing it down greatly. Um, and the reason why this is important to monitor and to keep note of is because this will make the availability of your server drop drastically. If you can't get into your server that's part of the confidentiality, integrity, and availability triad, as a cybersecurity person or a SOC analyst, you want to keep that secure. Everything needs to be available. And then going over here, we have like the WordPress login. These are all the IPs and countries that have tried to gain access so far. Uh, mostly Germany and the United States and then Vietnam and Thailand. And then we'll go down a little bit further on the right for WordPress again. This would be the URI path. It doesn't say here, but I'm pretty sure I said it for like the past few hours, maybe four hours. These are the pages or specific files that are being hit the most. So right now, nothing too crazy. What you would really want to be looking out for in an instance like this is if there's some files or paths that shouldn't be resolved or requested if those are being hit. So something very specific in here or if you see like the, the login file or login page being hit multiple times, that's an indication that someone's trying to log in. And then on this side here, we have SSH failed logins. This is for the past 48 hours. I already have a ton of traffic coming in from all over the world. Main concern would be right here with China. Looks like we have quite a bit of attempts. 234 being the highest within the past 48 hours, just from one IP address. So it looks like somebody tried multiple within an IP range, going all the way down until they either eventually gave up or they get blocked. And then a little bit further down is basically the same information, but this is just showing me the IP addresses and the country for the SSH failed logins. And you can see there's quite a bit of traffic there. Then moving forward, this would be the WordPress site that is up right now on my web server. It's a brand new installation. There's nothing on here yet. This was already generated for me. The only thing right now is there's a sample page you can go through here 
and there is a link right here indicating your dashboard which would be the login so if I click that it does take me to a login page and this is where people have been trying to get in so right now I'm calling this the Zephyr project so it's trying to fill in the name Zephyr that is the username right now for the WordPress um, I don't really mind giving that out because it's not going to be up when this does become public and neither will the IP address either okay so this is commander I don't know if you've ever heard of that but it's very similar to uh, using putty or the regular command line the command prompt here I usually use this though just because I'm used to it and I like it but I don't think I can zoom in so you might lose my face for a bit but I've been using this to log into my jump box okay and then from here I have three things right now um, the ping we can kind of forget about that at the moment I'll show that later but I can either log into the web server from here or the Splunk machine I have these scripts set up so all I have to do like right now if I'm going to go into the web server hit enter and then it asks for the password and then now I'm in if I go from here type ls I have some more scripts um, this would be for my Splunk forwarder. I can either start the forwarder or restart it. Um, I have other options as well, but those are just the scripts that I have or the most common things that I would need in there. I'm going to go ahead and log out. And now I'm back inside of my jump box. I'm going to go into my Splunk machine. Let me go get the password for that. Okay, so now I'm in the Splunk machine. I'm going to go ahead and clear my screen ls and all I have in there right now is the Splunk archive at least in the home directory so I don't have any scripts in here but if I wanted to do something with Splunk I would just have to follow the path that it's in I would probably start by doing like locate Splunk well that gives us too much information <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and stop that but you can see that most of it or all of it right now is going from opt Splunk and then so on and so forth so if we just go into close that and then I'm going to put my working directory we see that I'm in opt splunk ls and then there's a few different directories in there I'm going to go ahead and go into bin ls and then we can see here we have a splunk executable so now I would just want to do this and then I could either do start or stop or so on and so forth right now it's running and I kind of want to keep it that way so I'm not going to do anything but this is just to show you how I've been accessing the machines remotely through SSH through the jump box so again if I do exit now I'm still SSH into something but it's the jump box so the next thing I want to show is Linode which is what I've been using for these three servers you'll see I have my jump box my Splunk server and the WordPress there are two private IPs for the one for the jump box one for the Splunk machine and then there's public IP for the WordPress all right so you can't really see on the screen right now but on the side here there are a few different tabs Linodes is the one that I'm clicked on right now and that shows the ones that I have and then we have firewalls that's another one that I've used I don't have mine enabled right now but there's a lot of cool information you can do in there so for instance you can accept or deny certain IPs or ranges for SSH and then I have some other stuff down here that I thought I needed for the forwarders those aren't doing anything for me now um, I did have a lot of issues another reason why I want to bring up the node here it does have a lot of benefits it seems like but with the WordPress and with Splunk if you do a brand new fresh machine bare bones and then go ahead and try to install those things on your own there's a lot of issues that come about. I've had a lot of success with it on local virtual machines through VirtualBox, for instance. And this would be here that when I made my CTFs, I did a few. I have Windows, Vagrant, OWASP, Kali, so on. But for whatever reason, following the same steps that I did on those machines onto these ones, I was still running into issues. So if you do go ahead and decide to use Linode for something, uh, just try to check on this marketplace first. I think if you click right here and hit marketplace you'll see there's one that already has WordPress on you can do Kali Linux and cPanel that would be for web hosting stuff I've used that in the past and somewhere on here there is Splunk as well and there might be other sims if you go ahead and go that route 
they will work. Uh, the jump box is the only one right now that I have a bare bones installation with nothing already on there other than the operating system. I've installed things on my own, but honestly, all I needed really was to update it and then use SSH. I'm in my Kali virtual machine now because I wanted to show ways that I had been generating traffic to the web server. Uh, this specifically is a ping attack that I was using to try to simulate like a DDoS attempt where they would try, someone would be trying to bring the server down. So I have this code here that I uh, wrote. It's kind of taken, or part of it's taken from my Nmap script, uh, the interactive parts at least. But basically it's going to ask for an IP address, you put it in, it's going to ping the IP address one time, and if it's up, it's gonna let you know that it's running, and then it's gonna ping it five more times, and then 13 times, 20 times, and then 30. So that generates a lot of information there for it. Let me go ahead and copy this. Paste that in, save it, and then I'm just going to fix that name here to ping ls, and then I'm going to have to make it executable. I'm going to change the mode to executable for the file, and now if I do ls, it should be green. I'm going to clear my screen, and I'm just going to show how it works here by using my localhost. Go ahead and hit enter. Ping it once, it says it's up, so now it's going to go again, and then it's going to keep on going for a little while. And then next up, I have just kind of more of a template here of how I would be using a brute forcer for the WordPress. Uh, this is for Hydra, typically what I always use. Uh, same with SSH, I would use this for that, if not a website. But the only information I would need to change here is. Um, if I knew the username, I would do a lowercase l, put the username. If I don't know it, I would keep the capital L, put in the word list I want of usernames. And then for the password, I need another word list. I need the IP or domain name of the website. And then we have HTTP post form. And then we have our WordPress login and all the other information there. At the end, we see error. That would be indicated for what the server is going to respond for if we do not get a successful login. And so if it does get a different response other than error, it knows or at least assumes that it got the password right and it's going to tell us what that is. For the next bit, I'm going to be using my laptop. can't show that screen unfortunately, but I'm hoping that we'll see information here come up in real time. Uh, probably more so with the URI path where I'm going to try to brute force into the WordPress and we should be able to see a count. So I have that running. Let's see if this updates. Perfect, okay. So that came up now. We can see it tried 100 times, 104. So it kind of keeps going up actually. I'm gonna go ahead and run that again on here. And then we'll see if it starts going up again. And there it does. So this happens pretty quick. I think it's just maybe a few seconds off. I don't know if that IP address is going to be added in here eventually, but it probably will. But next, I'm gonna go ahead and see if we can get this to update with a different IP address. Right now we have most of it coming from that IP there, and then a good amount still from that one. I'm about to start the DDoS attack here. We can see it's generating something new for us. And I believe, yeah, the 82 IP is the one that I'm using right now. Ping attacked is resting for 20 seconds, so that on the screen in front of us may not update for a little bit longer until it starts pinging again. And imagine if I had multiple machines doing this at the same time, this would cause quite a lot of information being sent to the network. Um, the machine obviously has to respond to a ping request as well, so it can flood things and eventually bring it down or slow things down. And there it keeps going. The main reason why we want to take a note of this is because we would want to block this IP address. Uh, whether that's permanently or temporarily, we can decide later, but if it's generating too much traffic to the server, we want that to stop. Let's see, right now, we're already at 126 pings. 132, and it's just gonna keep going. 
I'm going to go ahead and stop the attack since it's almost finished anyway. And then that might update just a little bit more. Yeah, looks like it's going, but we'll leave that for now. I could do the same exact thing you're trying to brute force into the web server itself, not just the website, using Hydra again. And I would generate some information here. But luckily, we still have <laughs> all this information from China. Again, I'm not sure how they even found the IP address for the server. I had it up less than a week now. I haven't given the IP or website to anybody haven't made it public whether they had this ip somewhere on a list or if they just got it through open source intelligence i'm not sure um, they could have used something like shodan to try to find certain vulnerabilities or just google dorking a lot of different options with the open source intelligence okay so i'm back in my jump box now i'm going to go ahead and clear my screen ls we have our web jump script and we have our splunk server um, I'm going to need to do the block within the web server, even though I'm seeing all the information on Splunk. That's not where the traffic is going to. So I'm going to go into my web server here. Okay, now I'm inside. I'm going to go ahead and just clear my screen. Go down a little bit here. The command I'm going to need to run, since I don't have any firewalls set up right now, is going to be through IP tables. And that's actually what I was using to generate the pings into a log to begin with. I'm going to go ahead and type that out. So we have IP tables with the capital I flag, capital input, lowercase s flag, and then I have the IP address that I am safe to assume that I'm going to need to be blocking here. And then the minus J flag, lowercase, and capital drop. And then I'm going to follow it with two more commands. So I'm going to use and and service IP tables save and and IP tables and then the capital L flag. So I'm going to start the attack from a laptop again. And we'll see if this information starts getting bigger. Right now it's at 183. Now we're at 207. Go up just a little bit more here. 216. I still have quite a bit left for the attack. I'm going to go ahead and run my command to try to block it. Then we ran into IP tables unrecognized service. So I need to double check that. I'm gonna go ahead and run that ping command again to try to do the attack. And then I went ahead and added sudo in front of here. It looks like IP tables is installed, but for whatever reason it's not running. Um, that's another thing I've kind of noticed with the Linode servers is some of the things just work a little differently than other environments that I've been in. But I'm gonna go ahead and start this actually stopped getting response for the ping, so I think it might have worked. It might be this very last part here, where it just has the and IP tables that it didn't like. Um, so I'm thinking the first two might have gone through. I'm gonna go ahead and type sudo IP tables L. Okay, so it does look like it's on. It's quite a bit of information on here, but I can see that I do have the IP address as drop all destination anywhere. So it looks like that did work. And we have that stopped. But again, if I were to, on my laptop now, go to a different IP on my VPN, I would be able to start doing that attack one more time. So that is something that is very common and you can kind of notice that here, for instance, with the SSH attack. Uh, the IP addresses are very similar. They're all within the same IP range. So it looks like they would just do one for a little bit, change to a different IP, and kind of rotate that way. I believe that can be done with proxy chains, maybe a few other things as well. It can be kind of hard to mitigate something like that if that's what is occurring. Sometimes the answer to that would just be to take away that option. So if someone is trying to brute force into the SSH, you can't necessarily stop the attack because they keep switching their IP range. You could go ahead and bring the service down. I mean, if you know you're not gonna need to go inside of there right now, nobody is at that point. So you can go ahead and stop that service. That would be one example. But there are risks to certain things like that if that service is being used by something else and so on and so forth. Then again, there's other ways around it. Um, through firewalls and maybe even some settings within the server, you can go ahead and make it so only one specific IP address or MAC address is allowed to access that service or even the website. But lastly, this is a step that you would have to decide kind of the scale of it, how drastic or important is it to have this thing running, uh, to take away access and to block people. You know, some people might try to log into something one, one or two times and then that's it. Just kind of like, for instance, over here, Looks like the WP admin was hit two times through that. 
specific IP address. That's not really too concerning as opposed to this IP address trying to log in 202 times. So I'm going to try to stop one more attack here blocking another IP address, this time for the WordPress login. I went ahead and created a script. You probably can't really see it very well here, but it's called block.sh. It's basically the commands I just ran previously, except a little bit more automated so now in theory all I will need to do is type in the IP address and hopefully it will block and prove to me that it did it on its own. Um, this is what I'm going to be trying to use um, in this script here. I just went ahead and added it in to a different terminal. I'm not using this one to actually run the command though. This is just so you can read it a little bit better. So I have read IP so that should in theory wait for me to input an IP address and then it's going to do sudo IP tables and it's going to input that IP address, drop it, and then right here it's going to save and then it's supposed to go ahead and list the information for the IP tables and I'm just trying to grep that IP address so I don't have to look at everything else. Um, haven't tested this out yet, I'm hoping that it works. I don't see why it wouldn't. I'm gonna do block sh and it's just waiting now for my IP address. I'm going to be using a different IP address for the WordPress attack. So this one we already blocked previously. I'm gonna go ahead and see if we can get something new to populate and then we'll drop it and stop the attack. So I have reconnected the VPN on my laptop so that I now have a different IP address. This is waiting for my input. I'm gonna go ahead and start that attack here. There it goes and let's see if we can get something new to populate. Like some things are changing. Oh, it's probably going to be this one here. 157. Yep. Yeah. Let's go ahead and grab that. Okay, so it did give me some weird output, but let's see if it stops climbing. So it looks like on my screen here, I haven't gone past 560. Uh, you should be able to see that as well, I believe. Let me pull that over actually. I think I need to just move the screen. There you go. And then on my laptop, unfortunately you can't see that, but it is showing that it's just attempting and it's not actually getting any sort of status or response. So it looks like that worked. You can see now that there's a new populated IP address, the 157, which is the one that we just blocked. And then earlier, the one that we blocked right here was actually a Denmark IP address. So those two can no longer access our server or our services. That's just to demonstrate kind of an easy way to stop some attacks because right now we're monitoring these things. I do have alerts set up so that in theory if I was not away from the screen here, one of these attacks started, a trigger would occur and I would get an email and then go ahead and I can take these steps again. Uh, there's other things you could do, set up scripts to try to automate some of these blocks for you, but it really just comes down to what's going to be worth your time, worth the company you're trying to protect, their time and investment in depending on the SOC or Security Operations Center role that you have, whether you're just an Analyst 1, Analyst 2, some things are worth escalating so that a decision can be made with a little bit more authority. I'm going to go ahead and have more information on how you can set something up like this on your own. That's going to be through a blog post. Um, I'll have that linked down below. So go ahead and check that out if you're interested in creating your own sim. And then some of the commands you can do within Splunk. I definitely don't have the time to teach anyone right now how to use Splunk, but it is absolutely worth investing your time in. Even if you were just to host a website of your own, like I was kind of demonstrating here, having something like this set up is going to give you a lot more security than your web hosting service. And then one last time, just to reiterate what's kind of going on here. So again, I have my local machine, my personal computer, laptop, desktop, whatever it is that I'm using, I can access these pages through the browser, um, through the Splunk server and the web server, and then the web server forwards the logs to the Splunk server. More in-depth information is gonna be available for the log forwarder on the blog post. And then our jump box here. So if someone does get access to our web server or the Splunk server, whatever it is, they don't have our IP address necessarily for our local machine. So it just keeps us a little bit more hidden and a little bit more secure. They can get into the jump box and then they don't have or if they get into one of these servers, they just have the jump box IP and not ours. And then it's kind of the same concept if there was going to be, I don't know, some sort of malware or something, 
inside one of these two servers if we access it through the jump box that does keep us a little bit more safe.